What the Glover am I doing with my life? Ah! Oh, get it off with the Glover! What's up, Gloveheads? It's Seth back again with another classic Glover for your viewing pleasure today. I've got a very special treat for you this time around, a look back at one of the most influential 3D platformers, and arguably the best game on the Nintendo 64, the best game of all time, Super Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, X3, Toy Story 2. <sighs> Fine, we'll talk about Glover. The Nintendo 64 was home to a ton of different types of games, from racing games like Wave Race 64 and Cruisin' World, to shooters like GoldenEye and Doom 64, to sports games like All-Star Baseball and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, to whatever this is. But by far, the genre most associated with the N64 has to be 3D platformers, and with pretty good reason. The console launched with Super Mario 64, which in today's standards is a janky mess. But despite the jank, it was an incredibly massive and full experience, with plenty of separate worlds that felt full of joy and surprises. Super Mario 64 defined a genre and is still beloved to this day especially by speedrunners and fans of speedrunning. It was far from the only 3D platformer on the N64, though, with countless others following the example SM64 set, such as Banjo-Kazooie, Rayman 2, Donkey Kong 64, Chameleon Twist, Bomberman Hero, the list goes on and on. But there was one surprisingly disappointing thing almost every platformer on the console had in common. None of them reminded me of a prostate exam. Glover, released in 1998 by Interactive Studios for PC, Nintendo 64, and PlayStation 1 was designed to be as creative of a 3D platformer as it could be. You see, where most 3D platformers beforehand had you play as human-like bipeds who walked around and jumped from platform to platform, Glover tried to improve on that formula by having its human-like biped have to manage a ball through all the same platforming challenges. Imagine that the word improve in the previous sentence was said with heavy air quotes. This decision was justified by having the plot be centered around this wizard, who in the opening cinematic slips on nothing and dies. <laughs> skill issue. Somehow, his death sends one of the gloves flying out the window and the other into a potion he was brewing. It also knocks seven magic crystals off his wizard's castle. Thankfully, one of his gloves, the titular Glover, is able to turn all the crystals into Pixar-style Luxo balls before they hit the ground, but they all mysteriously roll into different caverns before they can be retrieved and turned back into crystals. The other glove, which got flung into the potion, pops out of the potion looking like Frankenstein's monster. The goal of the game is to play as Glover and turn all the Luxo Balls back into magic crystals and return them to the castle, which apparently brings the wizard back to life, all while the Frankenstein glove tries to actively stop you by attacking you with pirate monkeys, circus clowns, and a futuristic spaceship. I have a few questions. Both of the gloves are revealed to have complete sentience, even possessing their own magical abilities. Does this mean that they were always alive and being worn and used by the wizard without their consent? Does working to revive the wizard mean that Glover is actually trying to reinstate his own enslavement to a dead man, and the Frankenstein glove is only trying to stop him to preserve his own autonomy? Why is the castle surrounded by gateways to bizarre platforming worlds like the Lost City of Atlantis or the Age of the Dinosaurs? Why did Glover turn the crystals into bouncy Luxo balls instead of something that wouldn't bounce and roll, like bowling balls, which he's clearly capable of doing as it's a core mechanic of the game? And most importantly, why was any of this story necessary? I understand that they needed some reason to justify the whole ball mechanic. It was completely unique, and if it was going to be the thing that set them apart from the likes of Donkey Kong and Banjo-Kazooie, I get wanting to have some sort of explanation for why it's there. But come on, it's a 3D platformer. None of it was actually necessary, nor was it really adhered to. None of the levels actually cared about the story. The only goal for each level was just get ball from point A to point B and then fight a boss. I'd understand the purpose of a convoluted story if it were like Banjo-Kazooie, where the plot actually drives where you go and what you do in each world, but in games like these, sometimes you don't even need a plot at all. Honestly, I think Glover would have benefited if they did their concept like Monkey Ball. There's no real point to Monkey Ball, just monkeys and a ball going from point A to point B. However, it doesn't feel fair to fault Glover for that. If they want some sort of explanation for what's going on, sure thing. It wasn't an explanation that my baby brain was able to understand when I played it as a kid, but I'm sure it benefited someone's enjoyments of the game. That said, like every anime fan, I don't play games just for the plot. I'm also looking for that sweet, sweet fan service. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Let's talk about the actual game. I've gotta admit, Glover takes its premise of playing as a magic glove trying to navigate a ball around, and absolutely rolls with it. Thank you, thank you, I'll be here all video. There are a lot of pretty neat mechanics and moves you can really only do with a concept like this. Sure, when you don't have the ball, the game is pretty much a normal 3D platformer, where you run and jump around obstacles. But whenever you attach to the ball, the game swaps in a completely different moveset entirely, 
which I think is pretty cool. Now, instead of running, you can roll the ball around on the ground, or hop up on top of it and run backwards to roll around that way. You can also dribble the ball to give it some height, throw it in any direction you choose, give it a nice turkey cooking slap, and use it as a trampoline if you need maximum height. Glover is also able to transform the ball into four different types of balls, including the standard bouncy Luxo ball, a super heavy bowling ball, a tiny and magnetic ball bearing, and the original super fragile magic crystal, which breaks in a single hit, but also grants the player double points, so it's good if you're going for a high score challenge. In theory, these are all fantastic mechanics that feel like they belong in a 3D platformer about a glove and a ball. They make sense. In theory. In actual practice, though, the controls for each mechanic are super clunky and feel incredibly unnatural. I used a Nintendo 64 emulator for my playthrough, with an actual Nintendo 64 controller, which admittedly might have contributed to the clank as pretty much nothing feels good with this controller. But even after pivoting to a more traditional one, everything just felt wrong. Aiming throws and slaps is impossible. You can only dribble in place because trying to move sends you flying in absurd directions, navigating through water is extremely complicated, walking without the ball is too slow, rolling with the ball is too fast and impossible to take sharp turns with, and the level design was clearly not made for the momentum mechanics of rolling the ball around, which is your main method of movement. Oh, and on the subject of level design, every level in the game is simultaneously too simple and too complex which is genuinely impressive that they butchered both so bad. On the side of simplicity, every level is designed to be completed in an extremely specific, linear order, where you're provided a set of puzzles to complete, and only after finishing one can you even access the next one. Half the puzzles are little more than activate the switch or throw your ball at this target, and all these puzzles do is unlock more switches and targets. On the other side, while the actual intended route is super linear and simple, each level is designed with so much clutter that it's almost impossible to actually know what the intended route is. In my playthrough, I would often get lost in a level not having any clue what the next puzzle is or even where to find it. There's one part in the circus world where I genuinely have no clue if this was a sequence break or if I took the intended route. It felt like a sequence break when I was doing it, but given where it took me, I don't know! I'm genuinely in awe that the hardest part of this platformer was figuring out where I'm supposed to go to play a four-year-old's puzzle game. Granted, one factor that definitely contributed to my directional struggles was the abysmal camera system. A lot of people today complain about Super Mario 64's camera controls, with the claims that not having complete control over it makes it difficult to deal with. But honestly, Mario 64's camera does a pretty good job of always making sure Mario, and whatever he's supposed to be doing next, is on screen at all times. For Glover, however, it feels like they tried to recreate how Mario 64's camera works from scratch with Play-Doh, but then got bored halfway through and started eating the Play-Doh instead. Now, if you're clever, you might have noticed something. I'm primarily using footage from only the first handful of levels. If you were able to see this and conclude that I only played the first handful of levels and then gave up, you'd technically be correct. But probably not for the reasons you think. When I sat down to record footage for this video, I intended to take it all the way, to beat all the main levels and their bosses. However, I took a break halfway through World 3, because unlike Glover, I need food and sleep to survive. Little did I know that this would unfortunately be a death sentence for my save. Glover has a system that automatically saves after beating each level. However, sometimes it just completely erases your current save file. I thought originally that this was just some issue with the emulator I was using, Rosalie's Mupin GUI, but it turns out no. This was just a problem with an N64 version of the game. Could I have easily applied some cheats to instantly unlock all the levels? Yes. But honestly, at this point, with all the issues I've been having in-game, having my save file erased was more or less just a wake-up call making me realize that I was not enjoying it at all. It's wild, because I remember Glover being a pretty big part of my childhood. I used to really enjoy this game, and maybe it was just because I was a dumb kid stuck on the tutorial level who believed everything was good, but either way, I actually had fun, and I just... I don't anymore. Interestingly, this seems to be the general consensus of Glover. Back in 1998, the N64 version got pretty high ratings, all things considered, with critics and players praising both the gameplay and the soundtrack, which, I'm not gonna lie, the soundtrack is kind of a banger. However, today, I really can't find anybody saying anything good about Glover, and it's not due to a lack of discussion. In 2022, Pico Interactive re-released Glover to PC markets with enhanced graphics and support for widescreen and nothing else. All the physics, level design, and camera issues remained exactly the same as they did on the Nintendo 64, and it's clear that people don't consider it a good game in the modern era. There are plenty of negative reviews, and many of the positive ones admit that there's really no reason to spend $20 on this re-release outside of just 
longing for the nostalgia of playing Glover as a kid. However, there is one hidden little bonus with the Steam re-release of Glover. Tucked away in his game file directory is an N64 ROM for Glover 2. Or rather, what little bit of Glover 2 exists. Glover's original developers announced a sequel to Glover in 1999, claiming that it would have a better story, better physics, better graphics, and even support multiplayer. But ultimately, it got scrapped and was never finished. A prototype was found back in 2011, and the ROM was dumped online back then, showing that the game was slightly over half finished by the time it got cancelled. And it did seem to actually improve on some, albeit not all, of my complaints with the first game. Despite my gripes with Glover in general, I do think it's pretty cool to see this unfinished ROM be officially released. Albeit, in secret, tucked away in the files of an overpriced port of a really bad game. And, uh, unfortunately, that's where our story ends. Glover was a big part of my childhood, and the childhoods of many others. I was originally hoping that replaying the game would confirm my nostalgia and remind me of why I loved it, but... Uh, reality is often disappointing. Glover, you brought countless days of joy to my childhood, but I think it's time we grew up and stopped relying on nostalgia for fun. Sometimes the games we loved as kids were trash. And we need to recognize that and stop paying extravagant prices for games that do nothing more than try to push those nostalgia buttons. Okay, that's all the time I've got. I've got to get back to playing Mario Party Superstars, a remaster of five boards from the Nintendo 64 era of Mario Party games, which I paid $60 for. What do you mean that's hypocrisy? Everyone knows there's a difference between Glover and Mario Party. Glover.